One of the major contributors to 3D printing speed is how fast you can push filament out of the hot end. If you want to print fast, you can't just get a really rigid frame and some massive stepper motors and crank everything up to 11. Because if you can't push filament out of the hot end fast enough, you can't go any faster. So today we're going to be asking the question and trying to answer, how fast can you print with the E3D Hemira? Hello everyone, my name's Adam and welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be working out how fast we can print with the E3D Hemira. And to do that, we're going to use a flow rate test. This test works by extruding a set amount of PLA or any other filament out through the hot end and then weighing it. We can do this for a range of speeds slash flow rates to determine which is the best flow rate for that hot end. But in order for this to work, we need to be sure that the other factors that could affect it are not going to such as extruder steps, idler tension, and temperature. So we're going to be testing those things first in order to find out what temperature we should be using, what idler tension we should be using, and obviously we need to calibrate the extruder steps. So first off, we're going to do a length calibration or an extruder steps calibration. To run this test, I did the following. First, I pushed the filament through a 150 millimeter steel tube, then loaded the filament into the extruder and hot end and did a short manual purge. I then slid down the tube to the top of the extruder, cut the filament to the top of the tube and then removed it. With the hot end heated, I ran a custom G-code that's just very short to extrude 100 millimeters of filament. Then I can use a ruler with 0.5 millimeter increments to measure the remaining filament to identify how much has been extruded. Using a flow rate of three millimeters cubed per second and medium idler tension, 220 degrees Celsius, I ran this length test calibration and found that it was over extruding by about 5%. So I adjusted the steps per millimeter in the LCD screen on the printer, saved those to the EEPROM to make sure they're used in the future, and then ran three more tests, starting at three millimeters cubed per second and increasing by 2.5x each time. And these are the results. From this quite brief calibration test, we can already see how the output from the hot end is affected by the speed, but we can't trust these results as final in terms of flow rate until we have the other parameters refined as well. What you can see, however, is that after the calibration step, the extrusion quantity is exactly as expected, so that works. That's good to know. Next, I need to find out what the ideal temperature is. Like, is there a best temperature or is high just always going to be better? For this, I used a weighing method. At a given temperature, I extruded a set length of filament and weighed it on some precision scales. These are cheap precision scales, though, so their accuracy is not the best. But for our purposes, I think it's probably just about OK. I tested a range of 175 to 235 degrees Celsius in steps of 10 degrees at 7.5 millimeters cubed per second, taking three measurements at each step and then taking an average. The tension was set around the middle of the range again. And these are the results. At the three lowest temperatures between 175 degrees Celsius and 195 degrees Celsius, there's definitely some under extrusion. But once we reach 205 to 235 degrees, these are very consistently within 1% of the target, which is well within our margin of error for this test. So anything in this range would probably be fine. As I've already been using 220 degrees Celsius for my tests, I'm going to continue using that as there doesn't seem to be much benefit or loss from increasing or decreasing that slightly either side of 220. Next, I need to make sure that the tension on the idler is suitable for what we're trying to do. To do this, I needed to find the full range of the idler tension. So I turned it all the way to a maximum and put a mark on the top. I then reduced it by one turn at a time, counting how many turns until it's loose. And it became loose somewhere between the fourth and fifth turn. So I'm going to run the test three times at each idler tension, from starting from the maximum and then reducing by one full turn each time. And then until we get obviously to five where it's loose and you're not going to change anything anymore. And these are the results. From this, it looks like there isn't much correlation between the idler tension and the extrusion quantity at this flow rate. With the exception of the loose screw at minus five turns, all values are pretty close to the target. And there doesn't seem to be significant correlation, as I mentioned, between the idler tension and the extrusion quantity on the Hemira. For the flow rate test, I'm gonna be using the idler tension at the maximum as there doesn't seem to be a significant downside and that should provide the best grip possible onto the filament. So now we have everything we need to find what the maximum flow rate is. We've got the temperature set at 220, the idler tension we've just decided, and the 
steps per millimeter have been calibrated to be correct. By the way, if you enjoy videos like this one where we're testing 3D printers and their parts, don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss them. To test the maximum flow rate, I'm going to run a similar test to what I did earlier where I'm weighing the filament as it comes out of the hot end. But instead of just running three speeds, we're gonna run many, many more in the same interval. So earlier it looked like the peak is gonna be somewhere between the level two speed that I have and the level three speed. Of course, two and a half times difference between them. So now we're gonna run between two and 2.9 with steps much more often in between. And the results look like this. So this is where things start to get a little bit more complex. In the last three tests here, this is what I was sort of expecting to see in some point in this range, not necessarily there, but somewhere in this range, a fairly sharp drop off in performance as the hot end couldn't keep up with the required flow rate. The middle four tests are also somewhat expected. As we tend towards the limit of the hot end, performance does gradually decline. All of these things sound very plausible. However, in the first three tests, this is not at all what I was expecting to see. For some reason, there's a significant decline in flow rate down to 96% of the target before shooting back up to 99%. I'm really not sure why this is. It may just be an error in measurement on the cheap scales I'm using, or maybe a flaw in part of the methodology somewhere. It's something that perhaps I can look into at another time. What was very interesting though, is the swirls of filament or the test samples that came out of the hot end. They do tell quite the story. This array, if you like, of test samples or swirls, as I'm going to call them, is the extrusion from the hot end for each of these tests. Looking on the left side of this collection, we can see mostly tidy, very even swirls with uniform extrusion diameter, very close to the nozzle diameter, and they have a glossy appearance. In the center of the set, the diameter of the filament stays near to the nozzle diameter, but the appearance starts to become more satin, a little bit more matte, and the swirl diameter, so the overall diameter of that swirl shape, increases. Looking at the right end of this collection, we can see the samples where there were performance issues. The mass of these parts is reduced, but they also didn't form much of a swirl. Their extrusion diameter was much larger than the nozzle diameter, which suggests there must have been some sort of spring back after being extruded, and they were completely matte, apart from the very first section that came out of the nozzle that would have been a little bit preheated. So how can we now determine the best flow rate performance from this information? Well, strangely enough, test six showed a 98% extrusion, which is fairly good, but the actual test sample itself looks kind of deformed. So I don't think this would produce a very good print result. So although the flow rate is very high, if it's not really usable in a print, I think it would be kind of misleading to quote that as a peak flow rate. So what I'm going to do is use both of these bits of information, the physical test sample and the data that was measured in order to determine what the best flow rate that you can actually print with is. From examining the samples carefully, groups one to four are very similar. Groups seven to 10 are also very similar to each other and appear to exhibit all similar performance issues. Groups five and six seem like a transition zone where the performance is kind of all right at the limit, but they are also under extruded by more than 1%, which is not great. So samples one to four, I think are going to be the ones to pick from. If we look at the measured mass data for these, the speed at sample four seems to be achievable without under extruding. I think from this testing, test number four seems to be the optimal result. And this corresponds to 271 millimeters a minute or 10.9 millimeters cubed per second. But how do we now go from a flow rate to a printing speed? Finding the print speed from a flow rate is actually quite a simple calculation. By dividing the flow rate by the cross-sectional area, we get the print speed. The shape of the cross-sectional area I've assumed to be rectangular, but with rounded ends. So 94 millimeters per second at 0.3 millimeter layer height. This seems really quite fast and maybe not quite achievable. Is there an error in what I've done here? Well, there's only one way to find out. And for that, we need to do a physical test. We're gonna do a real print using this print speed. Now this is gonna be a slightly simulated print because we don't want loads of wiggly lines all over the place. We want some obvious places where we're going to achieve the specific speed and flow rates that we've requested. So I've loaded up a really simple cube into Prusa Slicer and modified it just with scale to be 150 by 150 millimeters and 15 millimeters tall. I've run this with a sparse 2% infill, zero top layers and a single perimeter. The perimeter speeds are set to 94 millimeters per second. And you can see from this preview in Prusa Slicer 
that we've set this at the target speed and there is no slowdown for cooling. The firmware settings of the printer have the maximum speed set at 300 millimeters per second and the acceleration set at 1000 millimeters per second squared. So we should be able to hit the peak speed within the first five to 10% of the printing line. Prusa Slicer also verifies the calculation that we did earlier, showing that they calculate it in the same method. As you can see here, the flow rate that corresponds to the 94 millimeters per second is 10.874 or about 10.9 which matches what we did in our calculation, so that's really good. The print took about 90 minutes, mostly because of a really slow first layer, but the results look really good. The Hamira has performed seemingly exactly as estimated, and you can easily see that the fast straight perimeters are perfectly formed, except for where there's some interruption from the infill and perhaps some under extrusion due to my retraction settings. I've not tuned this printer at all, so anything but the speed is a little bit not great but we don't need to worry about that for this test. This is just the speed test. We'll be maybe doing some more tests on those things at another time. So to answer the initial question then, how fast can you print with the E3D Hemira? Well, I think the best answer here really is 10.9 millimeters cubed per second because it applies to every kind of layer height and size and speed that you want to try and print at because that is the fixed limit of the amount of plastic coming out of the nozzle. If you're printing with smaller layer heights and therefore less kind of materials coming out at a time, you can print faster. If you've got thicker, fatter layers, you have to slow down. And all of those will still have a very similar peak flow rate. So that's gonna be it from me today. Hopefully you found this testing really interesting. It's been something that I've been trying to get into for about 10 months now, but I've had all sorts of other projects that I've had to try and clear off the table and complete first. So now we're finally getting into some really good testing and I'm really enjoying it. So hopefully you are too. Thank you very much to Stefan from CNC Kitchen for the inspiration on the weight test method. Really great way for measuring filament coming out of a hot air. And of course, thank you very much to you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.